Uh, greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. You know the deal. Uh, I'm going to read Genesis chapter 37. Let's see. This is going to be part, I think, 26 of the Judah series. And uh, pretty sure that's right. We're getting close to the end of this book. Uh, this is uh, chapter, well, part three of the book and chapter eight. And it's called Egypto Israelitish and Anglo Saxon Emblems. And uh, let's read that again. Well, he's going to cover, he's going to mention something that's in Genesis chapter 37, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, so I may as well just go ahead and read it. He mentions it, but he doesn't tell you, he doesn't uh, read the whole thing out of the Bible and then tell you where it's at. Um, he pretty much assumes that people have a, a, a working knowledge of the Bible. And I have to assume that people don't. That's, you know, I sometimes it takes me a long time to get to the point, but I don't know if somebody's been a believer for a month or 25 years. I don't know. You know, I just don't know. So I try to build a foundation. All right, Genesis 37, 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel which is Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. A coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. A little bit of jealousy there, huh? Huh? All right, so let's go read this book. Page 314. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. A souvenir of this coat of many colors, which Jacob made for Joseph, is still found in the many colored plaid, plaid, as worn by the Scottish Highlanders, not only at home, but by Highlander societies, which exist in nearly every large Anglo-Saxon city. The use of this, of this very colored plaid and the custom of wearing it can be traced as far back as the Scottish people have any history, and yet its origin among them is unknown. Gee, guys, uh, this plaid has been our history for as long as we've been a people, but where did it come from? Gee, I don't know. Yeah, well, I think I know. That is, it was unknown until they began to know that they were the descendants of Joseph. Also upon a time, the Gileadites, Gileadites were at war with Ephraim, Israel. Oh boy, here's another one I got to read. All right, we're going to read uh, Judges chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Um, this story 
figures in Freemasonry. Um, you know, while everybody else was watching movies and television shows, I was, I've been doing research for well over 30 years, probably about 35 years now. Um, I never was much of a TV movie person, but um, I used to go to this used bookstore in Denver and they had a tranny there. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, a tr tranny, uh, you know, like a transmission. Yeah. You know, on, a, on an old car. Yeah. Thank you, YouTube. But um, I used to go there and I would go and buy Bible type books and research books. Um, Denver was, I think it was like the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th largest city in the U.S. at the time. This was in the 90s, early to mid 90s. And um, they had, well, you know, uh, some Jewish guy would die and the widow would, uh, the books wouldn't mean anything to her. So she would sell the books to the bookstore for, you know, pennies on a dollar, basically, you know, a collection of books that cost thousands of dollars, you know, they'd be happy to get a, maybe a hundred bucks for them. Same thing with the Freemasons. Now the Freemasons, all their books say, um, if you called, the Freemasons, they would buy the book back because they didn't want the books getting into the hands of, you know, the, the common people like me. But uh, every once in a while, I'd find um, some books on Freemasonry. I mean, not books about Freemasonry. I mean, the, the Freemasonry books. I mean, let's face it. If you want to learn what the Freemasons believe, Go to the Freemasons and get their books. You want to know what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe? Buy their books. Don't go to the Christian bookstore and buy books about the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, you want to know what the Mormons believe? Read the books printed by the, the, the uh, Church of Judas Christ and Latter-day Aints. That's what I call them, the Church of Judas Christ. Um... Excuse me. But the deal is, I was able to get some books on Freemasonry and read about their little rituals and stories and this and that and the other. But this little story right here in the Bible is one of their little secret thingies. I don't know. I don't know what to call it. But I remember the story. And... Uh, yeah, I used to be able to buy books on Judaism, uh, old time, old time Christian Bible books, old time stuff. I mean, stuff from what was, uh, you know, 100 years ago. It's amazing. So, all right, let's, uh, let's read this little story that the uh, figures with the uh, Freemasons. Judges chapter 12, verse 1. And the men of Ephraim, now remember, Ephraim and Manasseh were sons of uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph. And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, J-E-P-H-T-H-A-H. And they said unto him, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? And didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. Now, who are the who was the children of Ammon? The Ammonites. Um, actually, they were the descendants descendants of Lot. You know, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot. Yeah, that Lot. Abraham's nephew, I think it was. Yeah, I think he was a nephew. Um, and evidently. Uh, they intermarried with the Canaanites, but, 
yeah, not good. They became enemies of Israel. So the men of Ephraim uh, got mad at this Jeff, Jeff, Behath, or however you pronounce it, and says, hey, how come you're going to fight these Canaanites and you didn't call us to go with you? We're, we're so mad at you, we're going to burn your house with you in it. And Jep, Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. Yeah, guys, I called you and you didn't come and help me. So what are you, you know, what are you mad at me for? And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are ye come up unto this day uh, to fight against me? You know, guys, the Lord helped us out, helped me out here, and now you're going to fight against me? We're brothers, you idiots. Um, then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileads, Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. So there, here it is, uh, the Gilead... The men of Gilead are of Ephraim, evidently, but Ephraim is, they're probably jealous that these guys killed the Ammonites. You know, there's always jealousy involved. And then they're saying that they were fugitives of Ephraim and Manasseh. So... Uh, so, uh, the men of Gilead smote Ephraim. They were kicking their rear end. They were kicking rear end and taking names, right? They were slaughtering them. Verse 5. And the Gileads took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, say, are you, a, are you from Ephraim? You know, the guys that are fighting against us. And he says, uh-uh, no, not me. Uh-uh, buddy, no. Verse 6. Then said they unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. S-H-I-B-B-O-L-E-T-H. -E I think I'm pronouncing that right. Shibboleth, S-H-I-B, Shibboleth. That's a that's one of that's that Masonic word. All right, so say now Shibboleth, and he said Sibboleth, no H. He couldn't pronounce it right, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites. Forty and two thousand. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gilead and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. All right, so these Ephraimites, for some reason, they couldn't pronounce that H in Shibboleth. They would say Sibboleth. No, it's Shibboleth. Sibboleth. Um, so let's read, let's read page 314 of this book. Let's, let's read it. Also, once upon a time, the Gileadites were at war with Ephraim Israel, and the Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Eph Ephraimites, and it was so that when the Ephraimites which had escaped, said, Let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto them, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, then they then said they unto him, Say now Shibboleth, and he said Sibboleth, 
for he could not frame to pronounce it right. The Ephraimites seem to have had trouble to pronounce the letter H. And many of Ephraim's people still have trouble with their H's, especially the modern Cockney. Um, Americans probably don't know what this is. You, you folks from the UK, you know what Cockney is. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I, you know, it's a, um, well, let's take a look. Let, let me, let me, let me do a little thing here. All right. According to um, the internet, the Cockney accent has become synonymous with working class Londoners. Uh, how to speak with a Cockney accent. Drop the letters T and K from the middle of words. Drop the H from the beginning of words. Don't pronounce the R at the end of the words. And it goes on and on and on. So there you go. But it's a working class, lower and working class London type of British accent. So, let's continue. Page 315. The Gileads seem to have worsted Israel in this war to which we have referred, but according to the prophecy, there was a t uh, to come a time when Ephraim would never more be conquered by a Gentile nation, and it must have been to this end that the Lord told the islands to keep silent until my people renew their strength. For of this same people, this Israel that is dwelling in the isles, the Lord said, Behold, all that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They that strive against thee shall perish. They shall be as nothing. Thou shalt seek them, even them that contend with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord. And that is in Isaiah 41, verses 11 and 14. Boy, I love the book of Isaiah. I, I, I really do. You know, the, uh, all the, uh, well, I got a master's in the Bible and I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying out of all the classes that I took, the, the only class that I really, really liked and enjoyed and were, learned something was the study in Isaiah. That was the only one that really, really taught me something. Everything else was, yeah, so-so. So, but yeah, the book of Isaiah, you could spend a lifetime just on the book of Isaiah. I mean, there is that much meat in it, really. And it's kind of like a mini Bible. So, when Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse Israel, and he could not, but was compelled by the Lord to bless Israel, he said, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He, Israel, hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. And if you don't know what a unicorn is, it's a... Asian rhinoceros. Its name is even Unicornus rhinoceros or rhinoceros, depending upon how you pronounce it. Uh, African rhinos have two horns. Asian rhinos have one. That's the unicorn. Not a stinking horse with a mythical horse with a horn sticking out of its head. No. And there's not many animals that can stand up to a, a, uh, a rhino. <laughs> There's not many animals at all that could stand up to them. 
So, he hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and curses is he that curseth thee. And that is in Numbers 24, 8 and 9. Now it is a most remarkable fact that two of these racial symbols, the lion and the unicorn, which were given to Israel with that com uh, compulsory blessing, are in the coat of arms of Great Britain. Bob's note here. If you look at the coat of arms of many European nations, Germany, France, England, you will see biblical symbols throughout. When I hear people say, oh, well, the, the Hebrews were black, where are where's all this heraldry and symbolry uh, symbology in their flags and what have you? It's not there. Asian countries don't have it either. South America, South and Central America don't have it either. Europe, Europe people. Now I should point out, um, if you're filled with racial pride, you're missing the point. If we are indeed God's people, God has given us a set of responsibilities and obligations. He said, if you obey, you're blessed. And if you disobey, you're cursed. You want to know why we're being cursed today? We've disobeyed the Lord. It's as simple as that. You know, people do the racial pride thing and they, they think, oh, well, you know, that's not it, people. Jesus told us that unless our righteousness exceeded the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you know, the new you-know-whos, that uh, you wouldn't make it in to the kingdom. Uh, that's Bob's paraphrase, but, you know, you get the idea. We had to be better than the you-know-whos. If we're the same as them, you're going to end up in the same spot they're going to end up. And just because you believe in Jesus, that don't mean nothing. I mean, the devil believes in Jesus. Doesn't, don't the devils believe in Jesus? We have to, we have to have holiness and righteousness. It's important, people. And I'm not saying I'm holy and righteous. No, 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 no. Don't, don't ever get that idea. Far, far, far from it. But we have to strive, you know, for to be fruitful. You know, Jesus wants his people to act, to be like him. I mean, Jesus fed the multitudes. Now, maybe I can't turn bread uh, and fishes into uh, baskets to feed thousands, you know, but uh, if you meet somebody hungry on the street, take care of them, right? I mean, you know, reach into that pocket. I'm just saying, you know, if, you, if it's winter time and somebody's running around with a t-shirt and they're freezing, give them a coat, especially if you've got two or three of them. I mean, you know, read James chapter two. Our works are proof of our faith. You don't go to heaven because of your works, but your works are proof of what you believe. What you do is proof of what you believe. You know, if you're my friend and I ask you to borrow $20 and you're 
absolutely positively confident that I'm going to pay you back, you'll lend it to me. But if you see a stranger you've never seen before and you don't think he'll pay you back, and they ask you, hey, give me $20. You know, are you going to lend it to them? Especially if you know they're going to do something stupid like buy drugs or, you know, alcohol. You know, so what you do is proof of what you believe. So, all right. Now it is most remarkable fact that two of these racial emblems, the lion and the unicorn, which were given to Israel with that compuls compulsory blessing as in the coat of arms of Great Britain, the insignia or national seal is in part the harp of David, which was brought to the isles by Dan and Simeon with the unicorn reared on one side and the great lion on the other. The lion is both Judah's and Israel's, so also is the unicorn. Not only Israel, but Joseph's, and yet, in a special sense, it belongs to Ephraim because he had the precedence in birthright. Thus Moses, on the day of his death, while he was reiterating and enlarging upon the prophecies and promises made by Jacob to each of the tribal heads and concerning the blessings of Joseph, his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, the thousands of each of the ten tribes, and the thousands of the one tribe of Manasseh. The English not only have the lion and the unicorn, but they also have that which to them may mean only a circle divided into four quarters. Still, it is really a reproduction of Ephraim's cake for the four quarterings are made by a cross. And we covered that in the previous. It's a circle with a cross in the middle of it. Yeah. In one of these quarterings is David's harp, and in each of the other three are young lions. That Manasseh was a separate tribe is known from the following. There was also a lot of the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph, Judges 17.1. Also the following, for the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs. Judges 14 and verse 4. Thus was the land divided by lot, as the Lord commanded. But unto the tribe of Levi, the priests, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance. Thus with Joseph's two tribes, which was promised double portion, there were 13 tribes in Israel and only 12 divisions of the land. So the Levites could have no land inheritance but they had the Lord, which was far better, and they were allowed to eat the meat of sacrifice from off the holy altar. And people, that is what the tithe was. The tithe was agricultural goods. It wasn't money, generally. You know, hey, I got 10 chickens. Here's your chicken, you know. I got 10 baskets of wheat. Here, priest, here's your here's your here's your basket. You know, that's what the tithe was. A tenth of the increased. Not a tenth of everything you had, a tenth of the increase. So if you had five uh chickens that produced 20 chicks, you would give two of them to the priests. You know, that's that's how it worked. But Manasseh was not only a separate tribe, but as a partaker of the birthright blessing. He and Ephraim were to grow together until they became a multitude in the midst of the earth. Then he was to be separated from his brethren and become a great nation. 
This is the reason of the prophecy. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, literally by the water, whose branches run over the wall. Thus God said, let the blessing come upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his, his brethren. Since there are 13 tribes in Israel, and since Ephraim and Manasseh were adopted after all the rest were born, and Ephraim is counted for Joseph, or rather that they are counted interchangeably, there is no, no other chance for Manasseh, numerically speaking, but that he is number 13. Now, it is significant. It is a significant fact that when Manasseh separated from Ephraim, when the people who have become a great nation separated from those who had become a company of nations, because the branches were continued to run over the wall, he, Manasseh, and or America had just 13 states, and that 13 is the prominent number in all the emblems and heraldry of the land of the United States. You know, the 13 colonies? Yeah. The first national flag of these original U.S. had 13 stars and 13 bars. Stars and bars, 13. The bar symbolized the union and the constellation of 13 stars was intended to symbolize the nation formed of 13 independent states. In this, the great seal of our country, as represented above, it's got a picture of... Um, uh, a picture of the Great Seal of the United States with the uh, eagle and the 13 stars, which are arranged in a six-pointed star configuration, if you catch my drift, since that's printed on the paper that they call money. In this, the Great Seal of our country is represented above. We have the arms and crests of the United States of America, we would first call your attention to the fact that the eagle is holding in what is called the Dexter Talon and Olive Branch. Isn't uh, when uh, Bob's note here, when Noah sent out the, um, the dove with the ark, did it come back with a, uh, an olive branch? Hmm, I don't, I think so. I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that. It's just something to think about. In the 14th chapter of Hosea, that prophet who has so much to say about lost Ephraim Israel, we have the following. O Israel, return, return unto the Lord thy God. I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily the national flower of Egypt, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon, the royal cedar. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. Ephraim will say, What have I to do any more with idols? Ephraim is a representative of the house of Joseph, and we are placed, and we have placed this scripture before our readers that they may see that the olive tree is among the insignia of the birthright family and that it is here represented as belonging to one of the branches of the birthright kingdom. And since the birthright is Joseph's, it is the olive branch of Joseph, which has been placed in the coat of arms of Manasseh, the 13th tribe in Israel, who has now fulfilled the prophecy of becoming a great nation. Bob's note here. What did they used to anoint uh, prophets and kings with? olive oil. What did they use to light the lamps in the temple? Olive oil. Did you know olive oil burns? Oh yeah, it surely does. So it was to be a light. And um, anointing with oil was representative of God's Holy Spirit. But that's a whole study in and of itself. But just keep that in mind. Uh, chapter, page 320. Still this fact, if it stood alone, might not mean so much, but in the other Talon, which is called the Sinister, 
is a bundle of 13 arrows, which represents the nation individually and collectively prepared for war. It is marvelous that the olive branch should have been made our official insignium of peace and that the arrows should have been made by law to represent the war power of the country. For the arrows were in the heraldry of Israel, as well as the unicorn and lion, when Balaam was compelled to bless instead of curse them. Also, the Josephites were bowmen, you know, like bow and arrow. Uh, and Jacob, after speaking of Joseph and his branches, said, The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Uh, Genesis 49, 23, and 24. It is a well-known and much re rejoiced over fact that the bow of the United States, which has sent her arrows into the ranks of her enemies, has always abode in strength, and that both her chief men and people have always said, God has helped us. Bob's note here. This book was written a hundred years ago. People, the United States a hundred years ago was just becoming a major world power. At the end of World War II, we were the undisputed master in the world. But we had traitors that gave uh, the atomic secrets to uh, communist Russia. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And would you believe a J judge sentenced them to death because there was such a public outcry? Yeah. You probably never even heard their names, have you? No. Nope. They were... Um, Spies for the Soviet Union, communists. Gee, what a coincidence, huh? A coincidence. Yeah. Yep, we had, at the end of World War II, we had the largest air force in the world. We had the largest navy in the world. We had over 100 aircraft carriers by just aircraft carriers. A hundred. I mean, we had more submarines. We were the undisputed master of the seas. England was far and away second um, largest navy in the world. I mean, England for hundreds of years had, had the largest navy in the world. For hundreds of years. But uh, not anymore. Okay, let's keep reading. When Israel marched through the wilderness, she had four standards that were called camp standards. One of these was on the north, one on the east, one on the south, and one on the west. But there were, besides these, a fairly, uh, besides these, a family standard or ensign for each tribe. Now, it's like a flag, people. Hence the Lord commanded, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign, ensign of their father's house. Afar off about the tabernacle shall they pitch. Numbers 2.2 2. The object of the camp standard was that when the time came to camp or pitch their tents for the night, the three tribes which belonged to each of these four camp standards might gather them. Oh, by the way, Bob's note here. When you look at the way Israel camped, it was in the sign of a cross with the tabernacle in the middle. Yeah. At the heart of the cross was the tabernacle of God. The cross. <laughs> yeah. They had three tribes north, three tribes south, three tribes east, three tribes west. Yeah. Sign of the cross. Or you could talk about Exxon, the sign of the double cross. You ever, 
Yeah, he's a double crosser. All right, so uh, da, 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 da. the compilers of our reference Bibles understood, then, understood this, hence they were given the reference to the four living creatures of Ezekiel 1 and verse 10. And uh, let's take a look. You had the uh, living creatures, which were, I think they were a type of angel, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and um, Ezekiel 1 and verse 10, As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, Numbers 2.10, and the face of a lion, Numbers 2 and verse 3, on the right side, and they had, and they four had the face of an ox, Numbers 2.18, and on the left, the four had the face of an eagle, Numbers 2 and 25. These are, Bob's note, these are the four standards. The reference to the lion reads, And on the east side, toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. Now remember, Jesus was of Judah, and he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Lion, you know, Judah was first in war. They were the king tribe. You ever heard of Richard the Lionhearted in England? It wasn't uh, uh, a bogo do bogo, uh, the Lionhearted of, of Zimbabwe. No, King Richard the Lionhearted. Not a bogo bogo or whatever, you know. It was a dying Jacob who gave the lion to Judah as the ensign, ensign of his royal house in the following. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Oh, this is truly wonderful for Mark this, when his race was young, Judah, as a lion's whelp, took a leap with Dan from Palestine to the Isles, and now he is there as an old lion, and the question is, who shall rouse him up? The fact that we find Judah's lion with the unicorn of Ephraim Israel in the national seal of the Brit-ish, Brit-ish, remember Brit means covenant and ish means man, covenant man, British, or covenant people is another evidence that the royal remnant of the Judean Davidic house found their way to Ephraim Israel at the time of the uprooting of the Pharaoh's line, who was then as now living in the isles of the Northwest. And it is also another evidence that the Saxons, the Saxon nations are the nations of Israel upon whom lighted the divine word who is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. The reference from the ox in Ezekiel is as follows. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim, according to their armies. Here again, we have the representation of Joseph, the birthright holder, of whom Moses said, His glory is like the firstling of his bullock. The Hebrew word that is being translated here, bullock, is the same as that in Ezekiel 1.10, which is rendered ox. Uh, Bob's note. Remember, an ox is a beast of burden. It's not a particularly fast-traveling animal, but it can carry a lot of weight and was used for uh, plowing ground. In fact, there is but one word in the Hebrew sure or shower for ox bull or cow but the above shows us that the family ensign of joseph was a bovine bovine just a fancy word for cow that's one of those twenty dollar words you know that's why a doctor charges you a lot of money and says oh you have a cardiac problem son or you know uh it's just a fancy way of saying a heart. But they hit you with these fancy words so they can charge you a lot of money. Bovine, 
cow. This is the reason for such expressions as Ephraim is an heifer that is taught. What's a heifer? It's a type of cattle. And Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Uh, that's in, I think, Hosea. It was also because of this fact that when Jeroboam of the house of Joseph wanted to make idols, which would be attractive to Ephraim Israel, he made two calves, i.e. a bullock and a heifer. The unicorn of Israel is now in the national ensign, in national insignia of that people, but the family ensign still clings to them as a national nickname, i.e. John Bull. Hmm. John Bull. I've heard that mentioned um, as a reference to England or Britain. Uh, it's sort of like John Smith in the United States, I guess. So, Thus far, it is clear that the Lion of Ezekiel's vision was the camp standard of Judah, which was on the east, and that the ox of his vision was the ensign of the family of Joseph, which was with the ensign, uh, which was with Ephraim in the west. As we continue to investigate the significance of these four living creatures, we find that the reference to the eagle reads as follows. Um, people, I did an entire Bible study on eagles. The Bible mentions eagles a lot. I mean, the Bible even says that God took Israel out of Egypt on eagles' wings. And no, you know, hundred thousands of people didn't crawl onto this giant eagle that flew away. No, it's a figure of speech. Uh, so, as we continue to investigate the significance of these four living creatures, we find that the reference to the eagle reads as follows. The standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side of their armies. We have already shown while explaining Ezekiel's riddle concerning the pulling down of him that was high and the exaltation of him that was low, that the eagle was, at the time, the ensign of the tribe of Dan. But since that time, they have used the leaping lion's whelp with the serpent's tail and the eagle, like everything else that pertains to national Israel, has fallen to the birthright family and is now the national ensign or ensign of the 13th tribe of Israel, the people of which are not only the descendants of Manasseh, the firstborn of Joseph, but they also compose the firstborn nation out of the many nations, many nations which were promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and whose ensign, ensign eagle holds in his beak a scroll upon which is written their national mo motto, E Pluribus Unum, which has 13 letters and means one out of many. E Pluribus Unum, uh, that's Latin. You know, there was a time when, uh, if you went to college, that you learned Latin and Greek, which were you'd be surprised how many English words come from Greek and English. Um, you know, maybe the spelling's not there, but the sounds are. I mean, if you study law, you're going to learn Latin. And if you study medicine, you're going to learn Greek. Of course, our enemies turn our medicine against us, but uh, yeah, one out of many. Therefore, concerning a certain land which is in, indwelt by a portion of Israel, we have the following, ho or hail, not woe, as in the King James Version of the scriptures, 
to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the water, saying, Go, ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their begin beginning. Note that hitherto a nation meted out, measured out by a time of prophecy, which is called the time of the Gentiles, and trodden down whose home or ancient land the rivers. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them Israel, the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria in all his glory, and he shall come up over all his Israel's channels and go over all his banks, like the banks of a river. That's in Isaiah 18, 8 and 7. Uh, have spoiled. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he, that nation shadowed with wings, lifted up an ensign, we have parenthesized Isaiah 18, 8 through 7 with Isaiah 18, 1 through 3, that our readers may know that this land which had set up an ensign of outstretched wings was a land in which Israelites were dwelling, for it was the king of Assyria who come, came up against Ephraim Israel, overflowing his land and led him into captivity. Prior to this, Israel... Uh, was held in derision by Moab, and the Lord, in condemning their arrogance, said, He, Israel, shall fly as an eagle and spread his wings over Moab. And that's in Jeremiah 48, 40. No wings, except those which are spread out, can be shadowing wings. And the shadowing wings of Israel's spread eagle are in the ensign, or ensign of the United States of America. Hence, America is the land shadowed by the wings of which Isaiah wrote, whose ambassadors cross the sea in the vessels of bulrushes, or literally of cauldrons which absorb water, i.e. the modern steamship. Bob's note here. This book is so old that they go by steamships. I mean, they were burning coal to produce, uh, to boil water to produce steam. You know, <laughs> World War II didn't have any steamships. Uh-uh. You know, they were oil burning, turbines, and what have you. So, uh, the shield or E-S-C-U-T-C-H-E-O-N, Eskiton, I don't, how do you pronounce that? Which is born on the breast of the spread eagle, has 13 pieces called pales or paleways, which comes from the same word, as paling or pickets. These 13 paleways are united by one ship at the top. The Lord said to Abraham, I am thy shield. On the national seal of America, the great people above the shadowing wings and the scroll is a cloud emitting rays of glory. Aaron spake unto the whole Congregation of the children of Israel, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. People, beware. Bob's note here. Beware when people start talking about the Shekinah. S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H. The Shekinah. They will tell you, oh, that's the glory of the Lord. No, it's not. It's from the you-know-whos. It's satanic. It doesn't appear in the Bible. Shekinah does not appear in the Bible anywhere. Shekinah is the goddess, the, the, the wife of God. Yeah. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared to, in the cloud to our fathers. That glory cloud was significance, significant of the presence of Jehovah. That glory cloud which hung over Israel, guided those who had but just escaped from the Egyptian bondage, and it stood between them and their enemies. But this is not all, for this cloud of our American heraldry surrounds what is called the constellation. This constellation is a group of 13 stars 
or planets on a field of azure sky and it's exactly the same number of planets that appeared on the azure sky in the dream of Joseph which drove him into separation from his brethren. Uh, Bob's note here. Uh, no, it's not. He saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon. So he saw 13 celestial bodies, but he didn't see, they weren't stars. Uh, where's that at? Joseph had a dream. All right, if you want to read uh, about Joseph's dream, you can read about it in Genesis chapter 37. You know, you could always pause this Bible study and go to Genesis uh, 37. And uh, he had a dream where the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars made obeisance to him. You know, they bowed down to him. And his father interpreted the dream. Jacob Israel was a son. His mother was the moon, and the 11 stars were the his 11 brothers. And, uh, and his father's like, am I going to bow down to my son? But he did. When, when Joseph was the ruler in Egypt, absolutely. And uh, when you go to, I think it's Revelation... 12. Uh, let me make sure. Yeah. If you go to Revelation chapter 12, uh, when you read verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. If you've never read uh, Genesis, this Revelation 12 symbolism would have no meaning to you. And I did a Bible study on Revelation 12. Yeah. Boy, I've done a lot of Bible studies, haven't I? Yeah. Listen, people, send me a USB drive if you're stateside and or if you're international, send me an SD card, at least 64 gig. A fast one, please. And I'll send you uh, audios. I'll, I'll send you all my work. Everything. Free of charge. I'll even pay the postage. I don't care. Uh, because one day, YouTube will boot me off and there's really nowhere else to go. I heard brand new tube is uh, also censoring. So there's really nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. I had high hopes for Gab, but Gab is garbage. Of course, I had high hopes for uh, Brideon too, and Bitshoot. They're gone for the most part. I mean, I got stuff on Odyssey. I'm all over the place. But, you know, I don't want to spend three or four months loading all my work to a channel and then they just delete it all. That's what uh, Bright Eon did to 240 some odd of my videos. One day they just deleted them. Gone. And and Gab, Gab was telling me I'm getting a thousand views a day. But nobody was commenting, which I think's garbage. Because I, I get to put a video on YouTube and I'll get a dozen comments on a video with a hundred views. You know, <laughs> Gab was garbage. They they were lying. There's no way I was getting a thousand views a day. No way. And then people would look for me and they couldn't even find me typing in my name. You know? Psh. Oh yeah, Bob, you're getting a thousand views a day. Make sure you pay us this uh, monthly... Um, fee to keep your host your videos yeah go to hell devil and I don't use that lightly 
Page 326. Any one of these features in the blazonry of our nation might have been a coincidence, but when we see that there is not a single feature that, but that which is Joseph and Israel, it is simply astounding. But when we turn our face upon the reverse side of the great seal, we are overwhelmed for there stands the great pyramid of Egypt, which is one of the two great monuments of Egypt, the birthplace of Ephraim and Manasseh, the Egyptian Israelitish sons of Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, and the son of Abraham. Uh, Bob's note here. Uh, yeah, I, I don't like the pyramids. They got pyramids all over the world. And I believe my opinion is they were uh, places of worship for the fallen angels. I mean, God, God is, doesn't say anything good about Egypt in Scripture. And this guy, as much as I like most of his book, he thinks uh, uh, Joseph's children were half Egyptian. No, they weren't. They were Semitic cousins of Israel. No, the Hyskos, H-Y-S-K-S-O-S, or... Uh, look it up. They they conquered Egypt. They were not native Egyptians. So they were Semitic. They were a Semitic people. So, and marvel of marvels, the national crust of England has that other great monument of Egypt, the Sphinx, on its reverse side. Thus do the people of Great Britain and the United States of America, the brother nations, by that which speaks louder than words, for signs are arbitrary say that they are the offsprings of the uh, Israelitish holders of the Abrahamic birthright. I think it was Churchill that said that the uh, English and American are common people separated only by their language. Yeah, you know, those Brits, they can't spell, you know? I mean, the color, C-O-L-O-U-R. I mean, really, people? I, I'm, I'm teasing you. Yes, I know England was around long before the U.S., so. Uh, the people of the United States made this declaration by that which was made a law on Thursday, June 20, 1782. And on that day, the ensign which bears those shadowing wings of Israel together with the heraldry of Joseph became a law among us. Also over the pyramid on the reverse side of the Great Seal of America is another 13th letter motto, which of course is not only lawful, but also national. And knew it, A-N-N-U-I-T, C-O-E-P-T-I-S, which means he the Lord hath prospered under our takings. This also is of Joseph, for we read, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. The Lord was with him, Joseph, and that which he did, the Lord made him to prosper. Genesis 39, 3 through 23. For those who understand the Kabbalah and the arithmology of the scripture, it is known that the number 13 is significant of rebellion oh boy uh bob's note here yeah nine and 13 are not good numbers in scriptures matter of fact when you get to uh the 13th chapter of a lot of the books in the bible it's bad things yeah uh yeah and he talks about Kabbalah, which is uh, magic and Satanism. Of course, numbers and scriptures, uh, you could do an entire study on it. Numbers, certain numbers pop up over and over. Like 40, 40 days for the flood. Jesus fasted for 40 days. Uh, three days and three nights, Jesus was uh, in the uh, heat, heart of the earth. Number uh, number seven is completion, 
the Lord created earth, uh, the Lord created the heavens and the earth in seven days. Well, on the seventh day he rested. Um, I mean, there's just, you know, <laughs> 12, 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, it's just uh, numbers and scriptures. Uh, there's a guy named Ivan Panin, P-A-N-A-N. He was a Russian mathematician. And from what I understand, he came to believe the Bible because of all the uh, numerology in Scripture. And you got to realize that Satan will try to corrupt everything that, you know, God does. He, he tries to corrupt it, you know. But uh, numbers and scriptures, very important. But 13 is significant of rebellion. But all that we can say about it here is that the first time this number occurs in the Bible, it is in reference to rebellion. And that's in Genesis 14.4. Surely that people whose characteristic number is 13 did rebel in 1776 and prospered in it too. Bob's note here. 1776, America decided to break away from Great Britain. I know why. Taxes. The, the church, the, the Bank of England. Yeah. Yeah, we had problems with bankers back then, but 13 colonies. They also prospered, let's read, keep reading. They also prospered in 1814 in another little affair concerning the acquisition of a vast stretch of territory known as Louisiana. This people have also had rebellion within their own borders, and it is a remarkable fact that although 13 was not the number of states in the Confederacy, the Confederate Congress in 1863 formally adopted a battle flag for the Confederacy and also a Confederate flag. The battle flag was a white field with a blue cross of this, you know, an X shape in which there were 13 stars. The flag for the Confederacy was white with a red field in the Dexter chief corner bearing the same cross, the X, with its 13 stars. Here again is both rebellion and the birthright cross of the House of Joseph. In this struggle, Oh, Bob's note here. Bob's note here. The Confederate's vice president was a you-know-who. His name was Benjamin Judah. Benjamin Judah. Look him up. Vice president of the Confederacy. Yeah, he was the one pushing for succeeding in war and yeah, it seems every time you dig you and you find something evil, there's you dig down far enough and what do you find? Yeah. In the struggle, the government also prospered and it was essential that it should thus prosper, not only in this case, but also in the others of which we have spoken in order to fulfill a prophecy concerning one feature of this history, namely, show my people their transgression and the house of Joseph, their sins, I'm sorry, the house of Jacob, Jacob, their sins. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? These are the reasons for which our race go to war. England freed her slaves in 1838 and America freed hers in 1860. One. Bob's note here. I know everybody will tell you, oh, the American Civil War was about slavery. No, it was not. There was a lot more to it than slavery. But, you know, the news media, right? Find out who owns the news media and you'll know who runs the country. It has often been said that brothers would quarrel. Judah and Ephraim did, and so have Ephraim and Manasseh. And the troubles to which we have thus far alluded have been family affairs. When it comes to these family difficulties that one will always conquer, which must do so in order to fulfill the word of God, 
But when it comes to war with non-Israelitish nations, whether it be to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, to break the yoke of slavery, or for whatever reason, then the Israel of which we speak will always succeed. For it is of literally fleshly Joseph Israel, of whom also is spiritual Israel, of whom it is said, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and also the following, the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion living among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the sheep, who if he go through both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. That is in the book of Micah, chapter 5. Verses 8 and 9. It is in fulfillment of these prophecies that Napoleon, the hitherto victor, bit the dust at Waterloo. It was in fulfillment of these promises that the American fleet entered Manila Bay and destroyed the enemy's fleet with the loss of only seven men. And if you don't know American history, uh, or if you're from Britain or whatever, uh, it was the Spanish-American War. We, uh, the United States, attacked Spain, and that's how America ended up with Puerto Rico and the Philippines and a number of other Spanish-speaking places. That, that's why Puerto Rico speaks Spanish, because, yeah, they were a Spanish colony. So, yeah. It was in fulfillment of these words of divine truth that the American fleet destroyed the Spanish fleet in Cuban waters and lost only one man. Yeah, Cuba was another Spanish territory. It was that these promises might be fulfilled that Sam Houston, with only 750 raw recruits, fought the decisive battle against the Mexican army at San Jacinto, April 21, 1836, in which he annihilated the Mexicans at one blow, killing 650, capturing 350, and putting the rest to flight, and yet losing only eight men and 25 wounded. But space forbids to tell of the many similar cases. When the children of Israel were singing unto the Lord over the victory he had given them by destroying the armies of Pharaoh, they said, Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O God, among the mighty ones? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? In the 41st chapter of Isaiah, when the Lord says to Isaiah in the seas, that they war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. He also says, Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. One fulfillment of this promise was the destruction of the invincible Spanish Armada. When they went against the English in 1588, concerning which the American Cyclopedia gives the following. The Spanish Armada sailed May 29, but a storm compelled it to return, and it was not until the end of July that the two fleets met and joined in battle near the English coast. After a series of actions that lasted several days, the Spaniards were utterly routed, the elements assisting the English. The underscores are ours, and we wish to call your attention to how the Lord helped. This armada consisted of 130 vessels, all told, and was unequaled in its time. Israel and the Isles had not yet fully renewed their strength. The history continues. Having, lest, having left Lisbon, and that's Portugal, for Coruna, for stores, uh, supplies, May 29, 1588, the fleet was dispersed by a violent storm, and though all the ships joined at Karuna, with the exception of four, they were 
considered shattered and had to be repaired. Reports having reached England that the armada, uh, that the armament was completely disabled, the governor government ordered its own ships to be laid up, but Lord Howard, the admiral, opposed this order, set sail for Karuna, learned the truth, and on his return continued warlike preparations. Soon after, being informed that the armada had hove in sight, he weighed anchor and, as it passed Plymouth, July 31st, stood out in its rear and opened a destructive fire. Having the windward position and having greatly superior in speed, he was able to inflict serious damage without loss to himself. All the way along the channel, the English followed the armada with the same tactics, taking advantage of the charging winds, harassing the Spaniards, capturing two or three of their best vessels, and yet keeping all the while virtually out of reach. The Spaniards proceeded toward the coast of Flanders, keeping as close together as possible. Off Calais, the Armada cast anchor, waiting for the Duke of Parma's fleet to come out of the Flemish harbors. But Parma had nothing but unarmed barges and could not come out until the Armada had beaten off the Anglo-Dutch blockading squadron, driving the Spaniards out of Calais roads by means of fire ships. Um, when you're in a harbor, the uh, English uh, took some old derelict ships, barges, whatever, loaded them up with firewood and, you know, like kerosene or whatever, lit them on fire and then pushed them into the harbor where they caught some of the Spanish ships on fire. So, you know, and then the English ships are blocking the exit. So yeah, the Spaniards were in a bad way. Yeah. Uh, let's see. In August 8, Howard and Drake now forced them toward the Flemish coast and with the purpose of getting them into the North Sea and cutting off their communication with Dunkirk. The battle began at daybreak off Gravelines and lasted till dark. The Spaniards were completely defeated. Several of their largest ships were lost and 40,000 men were killed and probably at least as many were wounded. It was impossible either to return to Calais or to reach the Duke of Parma. Their provisions were already exhausted and the English fleet apparently little injured, still hovered on their weather beam. It was imperative that they should return to Spain for fresh stores, fresh supplies. The passage through the channel being closed by the English fleet, the Spaniards, now counting 120 vessels, undertook to go around Scotland and Ireland. But in the neighborhood of the Orkneys, the Orkney Islands, they were dispersed by a storm. Some of them floundered. About 30 were afterward wrecked on the west coast of Ireland. Those of the crews who escaped ashore were generally killed, and it was calculated that about 14,000 thus perished. Uh, the Irish didn't take kindly to the Spanish uh, landing on their shores. And let me tell you something. When you got pistols that use black powder and you just swam through the ocean, uh, your, your pistols are no good. The black powder got wet. They didn't have bullets like they have today. And another thing too, if you had a sword, that thing weighs a ton and you're trying to swim with a sword. No, you're going to, you're going to lose the sword to, to, to save your life so you can swim. You know, you got a storm and your waves are plopping you around and you're, you don't want to be weighed down with um, a sword. So these guys were basically defenseless. And here it is, they wash up on the shore and uh, the natives are like, uh, oh, hey, you're here to invade our country and to take us over? Uh, I don't think so. No, we, we're, we're going to send you to meet Jesus or the other place, or the other guy, you know, yeah. So, remember these historic and encyclopedic writers are not supposed to know that God has said that in order 
to defend his birthright people, he would send a wind to carry away the so-called invincible armada and a whirlwind to scatter them. People, Bob's note here, from this point onward, Spain ceased to be a world power. Well, I shouldn't say that completely. Um, Lord Nelson, Admiral Lord Nelson, uh, at the Battle of Trafalgar, uh, defeated the Spanish fleet a second time. And from that point onward, England ruled the waves and Spain ceased to be a world power. I mean, <laughs> that was the end of them. But you got to realize something. Spain went to the New World seeking riches, not glorying the Lord. Oh, you may not know it, but the head of the Spanish Inquisition in Spain, well, yeah, the head of the Spanish Inquisition was um, Tomas de Torquemada. Guess what he was? He was a Catholic convert from a family of you-know-whos. Yeah, they were torturing and killing Christians. Yeah. Why does that not surprise me? Hmm, yeah. And the king of Spain tolerated this. You want to know why God let them fall from being a world power? I wonder why. Spanish Inquisition, people. Yeah. Hence their testimony is all the more striking. Surely the people of modern Israel who dwelt in the isles might also sing unto the Lord, saying, Thou didst blow with thy wind and carried them, their enemies, away, and the whirlwind did scatter them. Who is like the Lord, glorified, uh, I'm sorry, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders? Today Jesus has well said, If I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things, you know, spiritual things? Concessional. Still we call to our God of old, God of the far off, Isaac Line, our God whose word doth make us bold to claim our heritage divine. The Lord of hosts is with us yet. Doth he forget? Doth he forget? It cannot be that Isaac dies his people and his kings depart. Before his God, the Saxon lies. As in laying down, not telling, not telling the truth. Before his God, the Saxon lies. Glad and brave, but with contrite heart. The Lord of hosts is with him yet. Doth he forget? Doth he forget? Called in him, we are today. No longer passing through the fire. Although we are but yesterday. Though as one of Nineveh and Tyre. The Lord of nations guide us yet. Doth he forget? Doth he forget? When battles rage, we cannot lose. God makes all men to stand in awe of Saxons now that he doth use the race to whom he gave his law. His battle acts we are as yet. Doth he forget? Doth he forget? Our fathers once did idols trust, also their strength and iron shard. Now throw we number as the dust, we call on thee, Lord God, to guard, for thou hast proved thy holy word, shown mercy to thy people, Lord. That is the, pay, uh, the end of page, that is the end of the chapter, page 332. And by the way, Israel was called God's battle axe. You know what? You know who was famous for using the battle axe? The Vikings. I did a Bible study on that. Gee, what a surprise, huh? Oh, yeah. Bob did a Bible study on that subject. Uh, I don't even know how many Bible studies I have now. I got a lot of them. Uh, Last I counted, it was over 1,500. Send me a USB drive, people. 
send me an SD card. I'll send you everything I have. I don't copyright anything. You can post it all over the place for all I care. I don't care. Get this out there. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm just one guy, you know. One day all this is, it's going to be illegal. All these Bible studies are going to be illegal one day, soon. It's going to be hate speech. It's going to be a hate crime. Quoting Jesus is going to be illegal one day. Having a Bible is going to be illegal one day. It almost is now. So, like I say, people, uh, you know, just, I'll even pay the postage. I don't care. Please, people, get it now. And I got a whole bunch of uh, uh, text studies that you can print out on paper on various topics. Um, a lot of topics, actually. Um, I used, when I was going to other people's sites and making comments, like people would say, oh, the Trinity is a false doctrine. Well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the Godhead is. And you have God the Father, God the Son, or the Son of God, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. The Bible clearly teaches that man is made in God's image, and man has a body, soul, and a spirit. We're three parts, and yet we're one person. You know, and people are, oh, that's a false doctrine. Well, quit listening to the Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't even, they, they don't even, they don't, they know nothing. Absolutely nothing. They don't, they don't, do not know Jesus. And they're false prophets too. In 1973, uh, they were saying that the world was going to end by 1975, 76. Jesus is going to come back and crush this wicked world and show, bring us into his kingdom. Well, guess what? We're still here waiting for Christ. You know, they were date setters. That's about the fifth time they've set dates. And yet people listen to these idiots, know they're about their failed prophecies, knowing that there are false prophets, and yet they remain in the organization. Idiots. Fools. They, their faith is in the watchtower, not the the organization not jesus of course they think jesus is the angel michael the archangel fools what can i tell you and um uh, yeah just like the mormons the mormons teach that jesus is satan's brother do you realize their messiah is satan's brother well i believe them that their messiah is satan's brother but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. Mm -mm. No, uh-uh. Not my Jesus. So, send me, a, send me a drive, people. I'll send you everything I got. Or if I sent you one uh, a while back, send it back to me. And I'll load up the new stuff. I've done a lot of, a lot of new stuff. You know? I mean... It's coming. You know, my own family thinks I'm nuts. My own family, what's left of it. Mom's dead, dad's dead. Uh, my two brothers are dead. My sister loves money. And my only other family member thinks I'm insane because I see the one world government coming in 666. Oh, that can't happen. You know, because if that was true, we'd, we'd hear it from other people. Well, just because you got earplugs and earmuffs on and you've closed your eyes, that don't, you know, <laughs> what can I tell you? So, 
All right, people, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.